One of the most iconic and celebrated filmmakers of all time, especially in my beloved horror space, is absolutely John Carpenter. His approach of blending simplicity with style has given us some of the most beloved films of all time, and now it's time to talk about his humble beginnings with his first film, Dark Star. What's up everybody and welcome to my John Carpenter review series. This is one that I have been looking forward to and a lot of you have been looking forward to for a very long time. Earlier this year I went through all of Wes Craven's directed movies and it was inevitable that the next venture I was going to do was John Carpenter. So this month as well as next month, hell maybe even November depending on how busy October gets, we're going to be talking about all of the films directed by John Carpenter. I'm undecided if I'm going to get into any of his TV movies. I did not whenever it was Wes Craven's turn and so most likely we're going to be talking about just the theatrically released John Carpenter films and back in 1974 he kicked it all off with a student film that was eventually released to theaters titled Dark Star and this was one of the few on this list of movies that are going to be a first time watch for me. I actually had never even heard of this movie before. When I clicked on John Carpenter's filmography for some reason I was thinking Halloween or The Fog was going to be amongst his first and there was this little movie called Dark Star. So I checked it out last night and I got a lot of thoughts on this thing. But before I get into my positives of Dark Star, let's talk a little bit about the production and the history behind this movie. Because I do think this is a movie where the story behind it and some of the uh, more trivia elements to the backstory of its production is a bit more interesting than the film itself. So this is actually a film that started off as a student film project between John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon, who later went on to do the screenplay for Alien. So these two guys came up with this film and from different periods from 1970 to 1972 put together this student film that was a little less than an hour long, spent about $6,000 on it, and eventually it got a little bit of studio attention because of the help of John Landis, who went on to do American Werewolf in London, amongst some other films that everybody loves from the 80s. So. They got some studio attention. The studio wanted it to be feature length. They funded them to go back and shoot some more stuff using the same actors. They used wigs and things like that to keep up with the continuity of the film. And eventually the studio mandated on taking out a lot more of the adult elements of the film, like having uh, naked centerfolds on a part of the space station, some of the rough language, some other things going on in the film, and wanted it to be leaned more into the sci-fi and the comedy side of things. And so eventually Dan O'Bannon was quoted with saying once they got studio funding, it went from being possibly the most impressive student film of all time to being the least impressive studio film of all time. And then in 1974, the finished feature length version of this film was brought to theaters. Wasn't really an initial hit with audiences, but critics really praised it. Praised a lot of the early direction of John Carpenter, praised a lot of the humor that certainly fit and worked a lot better in the 70s than it does now, but we'll get into that. And even praising the utilization of the low budget for the effects and the things that they were actually able to pull off, which when all was said and done was about 60 grand. And there's even a bit of a discussion and debate out there that this was the first feature length film released to theaters that had an effect that showed a spaceship going through hyperspace. So with the critical acclaim, as well as the home video market, which back in the 80s and the 70s was very different than it is nowadays, that allowed this to be kind of a cult classic, especially in retrospect when people that love the name John Carpenter go back and watch this film like I just did last night. Now, as far as the movie itself, starting off with the positives on Dark Star, I will say that when you watch this with the mindset that this was a student film, from first time directors and screenwriters and all of that, just students put this together. There are some things about it that are impressive, especially for 1974. It's definitely something you have to look through with a specific lens of when this came out, the circumstances in which it was produced and all of that to get why something like this would spawn the career of somebody like John Carpenter to where a movie like this nowadays, you probably would never hear that director's name again because it's a bit of a rough watch. But some of his early directing style, uh, the score, which of course kind of became a Carpenter signature that he did himself, uh, some of the early weirdness that certainly crept its way into more of the horror films of John Carpenter and for the low budget that this had, some of the special effects, especially considering 1974 was the time that it was released, 
are impressive for what they had to work with. And it was interesting to see Carpenter do a more comedic movie. Now, this is a style of comedy that I don't think ages very well, but it's a style of comedy that you don't see prevalent in a lot of John Carpenter's stuff later in his career. He's got funny moments throughout his movie. He's got characters that are funny. He's got one-liners in certain things like They Live, but this is very much kind of a, a commentary on the subgenre and uh, different comedic elements that are talking about like surfing and kind of the hippie era of the 70s and giving more comedic takes on the futurization of what will become of AI, which is always something that has crept its way into sci-fi and horror, and even just the isolation, which is something that he later really explored in movies like The Thing, where you get these astronauts that are stuck in this space station that's going haywire in this years-long mission, and they start to get a little bit nutty with not having anywhere to go or anybody else to interact with. So seeing more of a comedic exploration of all those things that he certainly explored to a much darker level later on in his career is interesting. It's interesting to go back and see the early beginnings of this screenwriter, of this director, of the storyteller that became of John Carpenter. Now moving on to the negatives, I just gotta be honest, this is not a movie for me. Uh, I think that if John Carpenter didn't direct this film, this is the type of movie that would have been lost much more into obscurity than it actually is. Not to say that it's not worth being proud of or that it's not a movie that John Carpenter should look back on and, and certainly be happy with what he had, has done. It's just, Really old school 70s sci-fi is a hard sell for me. Really intentional spoof comedy is a hard sell for me. And the fact that this is a lower budget, a smaller production, it's a student film, also makes it a bit of a hard sell for me because it's just, it's rough. It's rough to watch a movie like this that was made at a very low quality back in the 70s on HD televisions in 2022 and to put myself in a space where I can get it. I appreciate it, but I don't really get it. Also, as I've already hinted at, I don't think that the humor, the style of humor, the things that they're being humorous about is something that ages very well. It was probably a lot more creative, had a lot more bite to it back in 1974, but in 2022, it just doesn't really land for me. It's kind of a more of a dry state of humor, a little bit of a an awkward style of humor. <laughs> And it's also possible that John Carpenter's strong suit has just never really been humor. I think there's a reason why there's not been very many funny movies in his career. He tends to go more for the screams, more for the shocks, more for the intrigue and the suspense than he does trying to make you laugh. And while I can appreciate what students can pull off with low budget and the creativity that smaller budgets have to pull out of filmmakers and, and make them make lemonade with not very many lemons, if you will, uh, there are some effects in this movie, there's some creative decisions that just baffled me. I mean, there's an entire segment of this film where one of the characters goes off to mess around with like his pet alien that he has just kept in this little airlock and a little chase ensues that goes all the way through to an elevator. And as soon as I saw this alien, I was just like, is that a fucking beach ball? And that's exactly what it is. <laughs> it's a beach ball with little clawed feet. And again, it, because you have the comedic element of this film, it doesn't feel completely foreign, but I see that and I'm thinking, this is John Carpenter that brought this. The guy that gave us Michael Myers and The Thing and Christine and a beach ball with feet. Okay. <laughs> Here's a fun fact for you. So Dan O'Bannon was a part of this film, obviously, and when he saw audiences not really having the reaction that he had hoped for with this beach ball alien and with some of the other comedic elements of the film, not really getting what he was going for, that made him take that initial beach ball with feet concept and mold it into what eventually became Alien. And he's quoted as saying, if I can't make them laugh, then I'll make them scream. So I guess in a weird way, we owe one of the greatest creature designs and one of my favorite movie franchises of all time to this fucking beach ball with clawed feet. Who'd have thunk it?
I also wasn't really sucked into the whole plot line regarding the AI becoming self-aware and the bomb that just wanted to blow itself up. Like, I understand some of the, the commentary and the philosophical edge that they were going for with that, with, you know, the, the AI coming to the conclusion that life was pointless unless he fulfills his purpose and like I get what they were going for but I guess because I've seen what those early ideas have turned into with movies since 1974 that I've seen the best versions of those storylines of those thematic elements that when I go back to something primitive like this it just kind of comes across as very goofy. Hello Bob? Are you with me? Of course. Which again was the intention, but it just doesn't really land for me as being something that made me smile or laugh. It didn't land on something that's like making my, making me itch the side of my head going, hmm, that's an interesting concept. It was just kind of awkward. And unfortunately, there's not really much else I can say about this movie. There's not really much that I can give that's going to be that insightful when it comes to Dark Star. I'm not the audience for this film. And so uh, I'm very thankful that Pretty much the rest of this filmography is going to be much more my style of movie where I can get very deep into what I like and don't like. This is something that was just never made for me. And so it didn't surprise me and shouldn't surprise anybody else that even if John Carpenter's name is on it, if it's not for me, I'm probably not going to get what they were going for. I'm not going to receive what they were trying to give. And this is a film that I just didn't really enjoy all that much. So all in all, guys, this is a film that is worth checking out if you're a John Carpenter fanatic or if you're like a hardcore old school sci-fi fan to see kind of some of those primitive ideas when that subgenre was really starting to take off with classics like 2001 A Space Odyssey. But if you're somebody that loves the horror and the suspense side of John Carpenter, this might not really work for you like it didn't really work for me. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed this, please click over here for all the John Carpenter reviews that I have already done throughout the years on YouTube. And I'm also going to put my ranking of my favorite directors, of which John Carpenter is absolutely on that list. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button so you can join me on the rest of this review series over the next couple of months. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.